Friends, greetings from the Lone Star State. Not exactly here with a cowboy Cadillac, but we are here with something novel, a hybrid utility vehicle. Well, that's what Kia tells me. So while we work on the full first drive review, let's you and I unpack the tech review of the 2017 Kia Nero, and let's start where we always start, the engine. So when I say hybrid utility vehicle, I mean something going on underneath here, not necessarily the form factor outside, which thankfully looks normal as opposed to like a Toyota Prius, which is screaming for attention, saying things like I hug trees and give money to polar bears and dolphins. Uh, basically, this is a hybrid system. It is a 1.6 liter four cylinder engine. Uh, and then there is an electric motor that is strapped to it. But let's first unpack the gasoline internal combustion engine. And that's 104 horsepower. That comes in at a very aggressive engine speed of 5,700 RPM. And then the torque's 109, which comes in also at an aggressive engine speed of 4,000 RPM. Not that really powerful, especially when you consider this is not the smallest vehicle in the world. That's where the electric motor comes in. And the electric motor adds an additional 43 horsepower and 125 pound-feet of torque. But as we've discussed in many episodes, you don't just add those together and get some like powerhouse. The overall system power is 139, and then the overall system torque is 195. Very respectable. Now we need to put that aside because there's two interesting things going on here. Number one, this is a hybrid. Uh, it is an Atkinson cycle engine, meaning the internal combustion. But what's more interesting, it's also direct injection. Then, what's interesting to you and I, specifically car guys, yes, a hybrid, but that usually banishes you to the world of the, well, there's no other way to put it, the horrible CVT. Uh, but here, Hyundai and Kia saw fit to put in a real live, honest to goodness, transmission with gears, six forward gears specifically. Uh, so overall, the system, it's not really designed to drive in EV mode on its own. It's designed to be kind of like a poor man's diesel. So it'll go almost 600 miles in range. That's something we'll have to unpack in the full first drive review. But now we need to put this aside because as exciting as it is to have uh, the combination of direct injection, electric motors, and real gears, this is not the piece that makes this a different mousetrap that you and I need to discuss. And here's a little bit of a hint. It's not so much driving dynamics. It has something to do with how light this is. Okay, so this is the point of the episode where I would normally drone on about driving dynamics, specifically what makes up the suspension. But that's really not the important thing that you and I need to unpack here. So let's get through those things rather quickly. Uh, McPherson struts here, independent multi-link in the rear, discs all around, and vented up front. So now that we've dispensed with that, let's focus on really what sets this thing apart. Kia loves to call this thing a hybrid utility vehicle. And really, it's just, it's a crossover, but it's based on a car. And there's a couple of points of information that kind of prove that. Uh, so if you were to look at this, you'd say, well, how does that differ from my Prius? Well, the folks that uh, drive a Prius would very quickly point out that the wheelbase on their Prius is 106.3. Well, guess what? The wheelbase on this is also 106.3. But then the Volt people, they would feel left out, so we gotta bring them into the whole thing. They're a little bit smaller at 106.1. So it sounds like a car, not a crossover. Well, that's when we gotta get into the height of the vehicle. So once again, the Prius people would say 58.1 in the height of their vehicle. Uh, and this, not including the roof rails, is 60.4, so a bit taller. But really, let's put all that aside and let's unpack a crossover. So a Nissan Rogue, which is kind of like the gold standard. Uh, the wheelbase, 106.5. So very similar in the wheelbase, but the height jumps to 68 inches tall. So think of this as kind of like in terms of dimensions, it's like, uh, it's just right. It's like the Goldilocks. And that's kind of what Kia is going for here. But then there's the whole thing about the weight, which you and I talk about when it comes to performance cars. But when you're dealing with efficiency, it's even more important. 
Now, that's where the Prius is more of the champion. It's just under 3,100 pounds, where this is just over 3,100 pounds, but there's an asterisk there. So that is for the FE, the fuel efficient model. That gets a combined 50 mpg. Sounds great, right? Uh, well, here's the catch. This is the fancy, like, luxury, ultimate touring model with electric seats and, like, heated seats, all sorts of stuff, and even cooled seats, actually. This doesn't weigh 3,100 pounds. This weighs almost 3,300 pounds, which has an impact on the fuel economy. It brings the overall fuel economy back down to 43 but it also affects the range. Remember we talked about that engine. It's not really an EV only kind of deal like a plug-in. The logic is to make it like a poor man's diesel. So the range on like the super duper like FE model, 595 miles, where this one just over 500 miles when you have all the stuff on it. Now while we're on the topic of fancy stuff, we now need to get to the inside of the car and yeah, I talked about some of the other things that this has and all sorts of fancy things, especially when you consider it's a Kia and a hybrid, but there's more I haven't covered yet, so let, let's go inside. Now at the top of the episode, I told you this certainly ain't no cowboy Cadillac, but that's not to say that this thing ain't fancy. It's got heated, cooled seats, even a heated steering wheel, almost as fancy as some of the Mercedes you and I have driven as of late. But we need to focus on some other things. Uh, you guys know that I love to geek out about Apple CarPlay. This one is fitted with Apple CarPlay. It's the same type of integration that we've experienced in other Hyundais and Kias. But if that's not how you roll, it's also fitted with Android Auto. Uh, then you look at some of the switch gear. It's literally off the shelf stuff from Hyundai and Kia, which is to say a good thing. But then we got to go back to that example of that Prius, specifically the Prius Prime. Like the exterior design of those vehicles, the interior design screams, I need attention, I need someone to hug me, and they're just, they're just too busy and it's like a nightmare to sit in those things. Where here it looks like a couple of Germans got in a room and they said, how should a car be designed, not a hybrid, a car, and that's what this is. But then they went a step further. So yeah, I'm excited about that Kia Stinger GT that's coming out, and that's going to be, what, high 30s and on up to whatever the different engines are. This is not an expensive car. It's what, 20 to like mid 20s. And the, like the tactile feel of the interior, it almost feels like they're practicing for the Kia Stinger GT. Okay, so I think we've covered everything on the inside. Now let's go back outside of San Antonio. So in summary, what do we got? Well, an interesting form factor with its somewhat different propulsion system. And to be completely honest with you, one that I think should have been around for a while, like I was perplexed back in 2013 when Ford decided to pull the plug on the Escape Hybrid. So it's a good thing to see folks like Kia and now Nissan with a Nissan Rogue Hybrid to come out with something like this. Enough where I'm looking forward to unpacking it and some details of it in the full first drive review, so make sure you come back for that. Uh, but until then, I want to leave you guys with a question, and the question is very simple. Does a hybrid need to have a ridiculous design, a design that screams, I am a special child and I need you to show me attention? Or can a hybrid look like this, a form factor that we know and works? And don't just give me yes or no, give me why or why not. And if you've got something like this, let me know. Also, for good measure, let me know what region of the world you hail from. Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word. Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, make sure you download our fancy new mobile application, which is optimized for season seven. And oh, by the way, we are live on five, count them, five international airlines. And number two, I want to leave you with a fun fact. And this one, I got to tell you, I'm kind of proud of. So I flew in this morning. Uh, I went LA, Houston, Houston, San Antonio. And San Antonio is a big military town. So you know how like you get to like a hub city, like a, like a Houston, where people are trying to race to connect to a different flight. And if your flight is late, the flight attendant gets on and, hey, can you sit down with the people who are tied for the connections and they can get off the plane first? And invariably, no one ever does. Well, the crew of United Airlines flight 1772 on what's today's day, January 30th, they got on and made an announcement that we have four military ladies who have been flying for two straight days to come home and see their families, 
Can everyone sit down and let them off the plane first? Not one person got up. Those four ladies got up from like row 30, walked the entire length of that aircraft, and everybody clapped a hero's like welcome home as they got off their plane. Gotta be honest, it, got, it gave me a little bit of like goosebumps on the back of my neck, and I was proud to be an American when I got here in San Antonio. Until I see you next time, bis später.